welcome all of you to Logan College this afternoon for a very special meeting of the Missouri Aviation Historical Society. Before we begin, I want to give a big thanks to Everett Sprouse and all of the faculty and staff of Logan College, plus all of our own members, for uh, helping us organize today's presentation. individuals and organizations for helping to spread the word about today's event. Karen Copper, Internal Publicity for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, St. Louis Section. Bob Delaney, President of the Gateway and St. Louis Chapters of the International Plastic Modeler Society. Dave Doherty, President of the Experimental Aircraft Association, Chapter 32. John Heaky with his St. Louis Aviation Calendar website. Dick Hyde and the Missouri Wing of the Commemorative Air Force. Hubert Looney, President of the Missouri Pilots Association. Mark Nankaville, President of the Greater St. Louis Air and Space Museum. Dave Schubert, Operations Director at Spirit Airport. And Carmelo Turto and his Aero Experience website. Let's give a round of applause for those guys. I just want to say uh, also, I think there's a bench up here, and uh, didn't you say a couple of interns could come in? Yeah. Anybody's yeah, back hurt? Probably, probably find one at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier this year, I had the privilege to meet with Everett Sprouse of the AC-119 Gunship Association. Ev grew up near DeSoto and Festus and was a gunner with the 18th Special Operations Squadron at Nakam Phnom, Royal Thai Air Base from 1971 to 72, and is the recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with three Oak Leaf Clusters. I was very interested in finding out more about the missions that Everett had flown on and the converted Fairchild cargo planes. Everett started telling me that there was quite a large group of veterans from the 17th, 18th, and 71st Special Operations Squadrons who had formed a group known as the AC-119 Gunship Association at their first reunion in Fort Walton Beach, Florida in September of 2000. After checking out their website and talking with Everett a few more times, we started discussing the possibility of having some of their members who live in Missouri give a presentation on their operations in Southeast Asia. A distinct honor was bestowed upon the Missouri Aviation Historical Society when at our June meeting Everett presented us with a copy of the AC-119 Gunship Association Stinger Shadow History Book inscribed by their president, Gus Senninger. As the St. Louis summer heated up, Ev contacted several other gunship vets who agreed to come tell their story here today. At this time, it is my sincere privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Larry Fletcher. Larry grew up in rural Monaco County, Missouri, and after entering the U.S. Air Force in 1968, went on to fly 177 combat missions in AC-119s, mostly over Cambodia, for a year with the 17th Special Operations Squadron Sea Flight out of Tonsonda. Doc Fletcher is the recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross with Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Air Medal with eight Oak Leaf Clusters for duty in Southeast Asia. After retiring from teaching in 1997, Larry devoted his time to writing and has authored two novels about combat in the AC-119 gunships, Shadows of Saigon, Air Commandos in Southeast Asia, and its sequel, The Shadow Spirit, Flying Stingers and Buffs in Southeast Asia. Please help me in giving a big welcome to Larry and his wife, Sue. When are you going to turn out the lights? Because I don't know if I can see that. <laughs> Let's not go there yet. Yeah. Okay, when you're ready. Well, first, Dan, thank you and Ev for putting this together, uh, especially uh, for the Missouri Aviation Historical Society, but for we old warriors from the Vietnam conflict. Uh, of course, it was war. And um, this ties in that uh, with November, this is Aviation Month, in case you didn't know. And next Friday is Veterans Day. Right. So it's appropriate, uh, I think, very much. The timing is there. Now, <clears throat> in addition to Ev, um, who uh, was a, a gunner on the Stinger gunship, remember, K goes with Stinger, AC-119 K. And remember, G goes with shadow gunship, AC-119G shadow. So when I say stinger, 
That's the K model with the jet pods. Um, some things that um, Dan didn't mention, but uh, Ev was born in St. Louis and uh, County, and of course he went to school at DeSoto, DeSoto and Festus. Uh, he joined the Air Force in 1963, to give his age uh, a little bit more, <laughs> serving as a security policeman. We call those air police, didn't we? Yeah, I think Apes. So. Apes. 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 <laughs> well, Ed uh, separated from the service in 67, but after a year he rejoined the Air Force and became a we weapons specialist. And this is how he got involved with uh, uh, weapons, mechanic, and uh, aerial gunners. They didn't get to fire. Now, and, and if you uh, look here at, uh, we got one gunner, Ev, and then uh, I'll introduce these as we go. Wade Dunn, he is from St. Anne. He lives in St. Anne, and he was a gunner on the shadow gun ships, G. G only has four Gatling guns. Stinger had the four Gatling guns plus two 20 millimeter cannons. Okay. Try to get you associated with the difference in terminology on the two aircraft. Same aircraft, different capabilities. Uh, Wade moved uh, to St. Louis when he was eight years old. His folks moved here and um, uh, he graduated from John O'Fallon Technical <coughs> High School. Um, one thing that Sergeant Dunn, he was a sergeant, he got to experience in a C AC 119G shadow the 23 millimeter, 37 millimeter, triple A enemy ground fire. <laughs> in a shadow <laughs> in a shadow and they found out soon the shadows we flew much lower than the stingers up there where there's triple a well they they quit that they quit that before somebody got shot down um so that was on the uh ho chi Minh. and then when he um uh, separated from the Air Force, uh, Wade uh, graduated from St. Louis Community College. So he's the second gunner. And the third gunner is um, Chief Retired, uh, Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force, Ron Gilbert from Neosho, Missouri. And Ron uh, is the only lifer of all of us. A lifer. <laughs> A lifer who is one who makes it a career. Well, Ron spent 30 years and what was it? 10 21 months? Days. 21 days. 21 days. <laughs> but who's um, How many hours? <laughs> 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 but uh, um, kind of a, a, a coincidence was um, it was at one of our reunions that Ron and I decided. Uh, Ron says, we, or I said, I student taught when I went to SMS Springfield, 1964. And I did my student teaching at Neosho High School. Went down there and lived. He graduated in 1964. He was in my PE class at Neosho High School. That tells you how old he is. <laughs> Well, I was 20 years old. <laughs> 20, and you were 16 or 17. 17 or. Okay, so um, uh, my hat's off to Ron for his service to our country. 30 years. Now we have radio call signs uh, in the shadows. Uh, after oh, about six months after I got to Vietnam, uh, they started uh, <coughs> giving the pilots, the command, the aircraft commanders, numbers to go along with shadow prefix on the radio call sign. And um, I was shadow 27. And here's shadow 28. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Lafarth, 
he lives in uh, South St. Louis County, and he's a native uh, St. Louisan. Uh, you can ask these guys questions more later. We didn't give them a speaking role. Uh, we, we would be here for five hours. <laughs> so, uh, but you can ask questions later and, and, and talk to them if you haven't done so. Ralph uh, graduated from the Rolla School of Mines, what we call Rolla School of Mines, Missouri University School of Mines at Rolla. Rolla with a mechanical engineering degree. And uh, of course, School of Mines is now Missouri University of Science and Technology. I think that's what it is. Yeah. It's changed many times since then. Yeah. Still Rolla. Well, still uh, still 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 Rolla. <laughs> captain, he was a captain over there, uh, Captain LaFarth, Shadow 28. He was fortunate enough, which I didn't have to do, to help train the Vietnamese Air Force in the Shadow gunships, which we turned over to them and which happened to the Stingers. None of our gunships came home. They were all given to the Vietnamese. And we trained the Vietnamese. I didn't. Oh, I flew with a few. One went to sleep. <laughs> I'm not sure. You know. That was an accomplishment with some navigators. <laughs> now, before I forget it, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, before I get off the subject of Ralph, uh, Ralph and I put this uh, book together. I say we did. There were many people. I was uh, even uh, uh, Joyce. She helped edit this book. There's something like 86 uh, uh, short bios, war stories in it. And you'll notice that this is a spiral edition. And if you're really into war stories, and uh, Ev's got some order forms for these books. These are 25. Whereas the book that uh, the association donated to the Historical Society, uh, they're 50. Hardcover books are expensive. <laughs> well, a little bit about myself, and um, I'll try to make this short. You know I was Shadow 27, and on the flyer that uh, Dan put out about this meeting, uh, Dr. Fletcher, now, I've, I've been on the radio and, and talked about my books and this and that. I got a call one time from this caller. And Dr. Fletcher says, I've got this pain in my back. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not that kind of doctor. I'm a doctor of education. So really, I'm an old school teacher uh, who taught high school at St. Charles High School up the road. And uh, I joined the Air Force because of the draft. And I got, uh, got tired of dodging the raffle. So I spent five years in there, and I, uh, uh, this, uh, just give you a little bit about pilot training. This is a T-38 white rocket. I broke it, trying to uh, fix it uh, to come down here. But you can see it looks like a white rocket, supersonic uh, T-38. And Ralph uh, and I had to fly that, finally, to get our wings to be a pilot. We flew a T-37 Cessna, uh, Tweety Bird before that, and a T-41 uh, Cessna 172 uh, before that. So you flew three airplanes, and whenever you graduated with your wings, you could fly anything, supposedly, you know, that the Air Force had in the inventory. But then, what happens? Um, you get an old slow thing like this um, that goes 150 knots. Um, if you're lucky. Yeah, after uh, you know, get kill me. I've got it down here. I want to plug this in here. Um, Thank goodness I didn't forget my glasses. <laughs> you go from being able to fly Mach 1, which you don't know that you broke the sound barrier. I broke it twice down in San Antonio. I did it straight down one time. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the wing commander met me at the, when I got off the airplane and said, don't you ever do that again? I did it again. <laughs> and. Uh, 
it seems the mink farmers in uh, mm. uh, <laughs> Texas call the base of the flame because the mating habits of the mink uh, are disturbed by the sonic boom. So you get in trouble there. But uh, for comparison, uh, 760 miles of an hour compared to 150 knots. You know, quite a difference. So you had to slow down, or I did, had to slow down my thinking at Clinton County uh, Air Base in Wilmington, Ohio, learning to fly C-119, and it had prop levers. You know, <laughs> lots of gadgets and stuff. You fly a jet, they're easier. Kick the tires, light the fires. No, you just better stay ahead of that jet. And the old C-119, you had lots of time to think. You know, you drive and drive and drive and drive and maybe finally get off the, off the runway. Well, back to my notes before I forget. The gunners, you'll notice there's three gunners here and there's two pilots. Well, on a, a shadow gunship, you had two pilots, aircraft command and co-pilot. You had two navigators, rated navigators. One was a, um, at the, uh, on the crew deck, flight deck, and uh, ran the maps and, and uh, firing, uh, firing uh, computer, which we'll talk about more. And then you had a, one of the navigators ran the NAS, Night Observation School, infrared, back there looking out the side of the airplane. Um, they give you an idea here, because we're going to go have big pictures here in a bit, where that door was off, night observation code. Well, that uh, uh, navigator would be back there, and at nighttime, uh, he would um, put his crosshairs on the uh, target, and it would be transmitted through the computer. We had a computer way back then, and then that image would transfer on the pilot's gun sight. So you'd fly those two crosshairs together, and then depending on how close you wanted to fly at, uh, to the friendly troops, you push the button, and if you were there, you'd hit the target. And sometimes, we never saw the target, did we? Black. Only the guy back there in the back saw it, infrared. Well, sophistication got better with the old Stinger. And this is what Ed and Ron flew on. Uh, I, I mentioned the uh, 20 millimeter cannons. Here they are, four mini guns also. So they've had all four guns on of the mini guns, 24,000 rounds in one minute. Of course, you eat up all your ammunition, and you have to go home. Or, you know. But, a very devastating. And then the, um, the 20 millimeter cannons, they, uh, the Stingers flew on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, up where the big uh, anti-aircraft guns were, 23 millimeter, uh, 37 millimeter, 57 millimeter, um, there were some uh, that were uh, 155 millimeter. They, they, the North Vietnamese wanted to protect their um, line of communication there to Vietnam with supplies. And so uh, the 20 millimeter cannons, K model, they could pierce. They had uh, armor piercing bullets and uh, they could knock out trucks or in one case, uh, during a battle in uh, 1971, um, one stinger destroyed four or eight uh, North Vietnamese tanks. Armor piercing uh, will knock out tanks, and they got eight tanks that night. And when we, when I talk about uh, 7.62 and all those thousands uh, of uh, bullets a minute, these are the casings of it. It's like a Gatling gun you've seen. 
so four of those. These happen to be from what we call my, uh, cherry flight, when you're first flight up and you're the aircraft commander. So the gunner saved those and gave them to me, and the U.S. taxpayer sent them home for me when I came home, because <laughs> they sent my trunk home. But I wanted to tell you, too, uh, about gunners. We have two uh, navigators, right? Shadows, two gunners, and stingers had three gunners, because they had the four mini guns, Gatling guns, and they had the two 20 miller. So, and then it back up a little bit. Navigators, the stinger with the 20 millimeter guns and the props are the uh, J85 jets. That was the, the created uh, a lot more weight. Two pilots, three navigators, three gunners. And then we had uh, an um, an I.O. was an illuminator operator, and in the back of the airplane, uh, we had uh, a flare launcher. You'll see pictures of it, so when we go through it, you'll know what I'm talking about. 24 flares, and uh, the pilot would order I.O. illuminator operator, and they lasted uh, two to three minutes hang time, uh, depending on our altitude. Okay because shadows flew lower. Uh, alpha, A altitude was 1,500 feet over enemy territory. B altitude was uh, 2,500 feet. C altitude, uh, 4,500 feet, 3,500 3, feet. And then delta altitude, 4,500 feet. The stingers flying over the big AAA, they flew 45, 55, 65. Uh, it was serious business. Whereas the shadows, we, we were primarily uh, anti-personnel, uh, defenders of camps and, and bases and fire bases and uh, uh, convoys and such. So we could, we, we could see pretty good, especially in the daytime. Now, one tale about the gunners, before I forget it. The gunners have proven in our association to be the most enthusiastic and spirited bunch. And of course, most of them were younger than pilots and navigators, okay? Uh, one one, one uh, a crew member I forgot to mention was flight engineer. On the flight deck, there was a flight engineer. And you'll see a picture of the two pilots, and then there's a uh, helmet right in the middle there between them. And uh, he helped uh, monitor all the engines, uh, figured bingo fuel when we had to leave a target and get back so we have enough fuel to land and such. So there was a flight engineer uh, on, <coughs> on the flight deck. <coughs> Eight crew members on the shadow. The G. Stinger, 10 crew members. Now, what did that third man do on the Stinger? He was a floor operator, forward looking uh, infrared radar. And he had more computers. He had a screen back there and get that image of those tanks down there, those movers. And that would transmit up there on the gun side of the pilot. And the pilot, the front of the airplane's up that way. Gun sights here. You're flying in a circle. 360 degree circumference. You keep the target inside at all time. That's what's so effective about the gunships over a fighter. They, they dive in there, they have to have a forward air controller, usually to attack, to, to keep the uh, uh, target inside. Well, I remember that old flight engineer in the middle, uh, up there, uh, hovering over the pilot's <coughs> console, and he's watching all the gauges and this and that. But the pilot, um, 
would, um, in the firing circle, in that 360 degree orbit, the pilot would, uh, um, you know, work the ailerons, and he's looking out at, at the target, or just in the gun sight, uh, if it's nighttime and he can't see the ground, but he's staring over here, and he's got to watch out, especially at nighttime for vertigo. Well, who's watching out? The co-pilot. The co-pilot over there is making sure you stay at the firing altitude. If the altitude uh, is 3,500 feet, and uh, the guns are set for that elevation, you change altitude, the gunner's back there cussing the pilot <coughs> and saying, you know, it takes a lot of work to change the elevation of those <coughs> guns. Uh, and then the flight engineer, uh, he is leaning out the engines to cut down the uh, fire out of the smokestacks mm -hmm. so that you're getting maximum fuel uh, air ratio, get maximum mileage, and uh, and plus, um, well, on the on the K model, the Stinger, the the co-pilot has also works the two toggle switches for the jet engines. They call out brake right, brake left, triple A. Scanners picking up back there. Gunners are looking out and hanging out the airplane, out the open doors. Uh, well, they need to get out of there, kick in the jets, and you know, move right or left. Or, but in the in the uh, uh, coordination of it, you've got the uh, pilot flying the aircraft. Depending on which aircraft, but. Shadows, we, we talked to the people on the ground we were supporting. Move your fire north a meter or a click. And uh, whereas the K models flying up on the uh, trail and in the barrel roll and the uh, uh, steel tiger, they, they very seldom talked to anybody on the ground. They were truck hunters. I mean, they were really out there hunting the enemy. Whereas the shadow, we would uh, usually be called into a TIC troops in contact. We were the only unit that did, did our own facking. Right. That provided air support. Yeah. So we could, we could get the target coordinated and put ordnance on the target without going through a forward air controller. All the other fighters and stuff had to have a right. forward air A FAC is a forward air controller. Young man, what's your question? Real fast. Weren't there some rivers where you could shoot up boats and some rivers that you couldn't? Or some well, we had free fire zones. When we went into Cambodia and we were flying to um, uh, support the Cambodian government, and uh, <coughs> against the Khmer Rouge, the communist uh, Cambodians, and the Viet Cong, North Vietnamese troops, because when American troops and uh, South Vietnamese troops invaded Cambodia in uh, May of 70, the, the North Vietnamese training camps and Viet Cong, they just went deeper into Cambodia. Well, we shadows, we supported that invasion, but we also followed it. And then at the end of June, when President Nixon said, we're withdrawing our troops, we stayed 24 hours coverage a day, every day of the week. That's when we got into really flying in daytime. But there was not big triple A uh, guns over Cambodia. We had some stingers come down and got to enjoy the turkey shoot. I shouldn't say that like that, but uh, because you can, the pilot can see, he can shoot manually, okay? You don't have to go through the computer. And if you're cleared to fire, you can shoot. Um, 
sand pans, trucks, motorbikes, they've gone, all been worn. <coughs> Leaflets were dropped by, uh, by psyops, psychological warfare. Uh, people, they go out there and they announce over speakers, if you're caught out on this road or you're caught out on the Mekong River, such and such time, your enemy, considered enemy. And we would go armed reconnaissance. And if they were there, we sunk the boat. Okay? Okay, if, let's, uh, let's get this thing going here. And There's so many things to tell it's hard to keep it in 30 minutes without boring or you know getting confused okay the first slide is and I'll talk let's see where's everybody at? Uh, oh it doesn't matter <coughs> the first slide is the conversion of C one nineteen G's that's the silver ones into AC, A for attack. So you're going to take a cargo airplane like they did with a C-47, DC-3. C-47s, uh, World War II type, the backbone of the Army Air Corps. And uh, they made that into a gunship and had three miniguns, okay? And we won't go too deep into the, it was called Puff the Magic Dragon, Puff, and Spooky. Then we could spend hours on all these different gunships. But this is gunship number three project, gunship three. Pro project gunship one was the Spooky, AC-47s. They were the first ones. And then... The second gunship project was two, which was a C-130, four-engine turboprop. There was a shortage of frames of C-130s uh, in Southeast Asia, worldwide. They were so critical for uh, supplies and cargo and stuff that uh, they only made 11, and by 1970, there were only 11 AC-130s. So, Melvin Laird and Secretary Brown um, decided there's lots of 119s. There's reserves, they're flying them. So, let's make a fleet of AC-119s until we can find more airframes of C-130s to make the gunship we really want. So they said, okay, let's take 52 of these C-119Gs and let's convert them, 32 of them, into a G model gunship, a C-119G Shadow. And they take the other 32 and make those into the K model. The one with the jets, the one with the 20 millimeter cannons. But we'll make the uh, G model, which is the, became the Shadow, we'll make those 32 first so they can, we can use them for training, get them over to Vietnam, fly them over there, and they can replace the Spooky, the AC-47s, because they want to turn those over to the VNAF, the Vietnamese Air Force, South, that is. So that was the process there. This was the uh, Fairchild Hiller um, plant in St. Augustine, Florida. <coughs> we held a reunion there a couple of years ago, and we got to see those old plants and stuff uh, of that, uh, you know, conversion of a cargo airplane uh, into a, a, a weapon system. And just, I might say this again, but I'll say it now so I don't forget. There have been so many people that said, uh, you know, uh, one of the 
most best, most defective weapon systems to come out of the whole Vietnam War were fixed wing gunships. Not helicopter gunships, fixed wing gunships. Okay, that, that's your... Mm -hmm. So that said quite a bit after it was all over the war and everything. All right, we, we, <clears throat> we get these birds. Well, they gotta have somebody fly. So they took the 71st Troop um, Assault Squadron, no, not Troop uh, t TAS, T A. Well, Tactical Airlift, there you go. Tactical Airlift uh, Squadron out of Bacalar Air Force Base, Indiana. And they activate them, activated that squadron for one year's time. And they started with the G's. Of course, they knew how to fly the C-119s. They were all expert pilots, lieutenant colonels, majors, uh, years of experience. So their first step was to go down to Lockbourne Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, and start the training program with the 44th uh, Combat Crew Combat Training Squadron, which all of us got trained in eventually and uh, and that started in the summer and August they started their training and by the end of December of 68 the 71st tactical air squadron had become the 71st air commando squadron for a short short period of time the Air Force changed air commandos to special operations. So they became the 71st Special Operations Squadron. And to continue with that squadron, lying in the shadows, I'm writing a book on that now, just on the shadows. The 71st uh, served in Vietnam for six months and uh, uh, weighed uh, were you over there? I got there in uh, late 68. Right. Well, they sent an advanced team over uh, to uh, Nha Trang uh, Air Base on the coast of Vietnam, there on the South China Sea. Beautiful place. And, uh, and <clears throat> so they started uh, uh, ferrying these AC-119s. And they went up the coast, up to Alaska and around the shoehorn of uh, uh, the Alaska Peninsula and through the islands uh, down to the Philippines and into Vietnam. But the reservists were the ones that actually started the shadow operations in South Vietnam. And once they, and also there were regular Air Force people, shortage people like gunners, uh, who had to be specially trained for the gunship. Illuminator operators came from uh, the loadmasters on C-119s. A lot of cross training to come up with a combat crew of eight. Then in June of, um, June the 1st, the 71st had gone home a few days before and they were replaced by the regular Air Force 17th Special Operations Squadron. Flying the shadow. It wasn't long after that that the uh, 18th showed up. They had gotten most of the shadow crews through and over there replacing those C-47s so that they could be given to the Vietnamese. And then the 18th came in. And uh, I've got the exact dates on there, but by 1973, uh, well, in 1971, the shadows were all given to the Vietnamese. And the 17th was inactivated. The 18th was inactivated in 19. 
being an old school teacher, I need a pointer. Right. Now that is the Shadow gunship, the G model. It has no jets, and you can see four lines there, only four miniguns. We call it M-I-N-I-G-U-N, Gatling type guns, six barrels. Next one. Oh, back that up, Kenny. You'll notice there, Darby Perrin Aviation Art. The, this uh, uh, slide and the next one, uh, Darby Perrin was uh, can't think of the uh, engaged uh, the, the AC-119. We we contracted with them. Uh, he is an excellent author, and you can go to his website and. Uh, Oh, he's got beautiful paintings of all kinds of World War II aircraft. He's an Air Force guy. Uh, uh, he's a boom operator on a KC-135 tanker, or was. But uh, to give him credit. Now, <clears throat> this is the K model Stinger. See the two jets? And then you see the big 20 millimeter cannons, in addition to the mini. <coughs> Okay, next slide. <clears throat> this is a G model, interior. Okay, here is a white light, a big white spotlight. And it worked pretty good in the beginning. But then uh, Viet Cong <laughs> learned that that's a mighty good target. <laughs> and we didn't use it very much. Uh, we had flares. That that's on the left left paratroop door. Now on the other side was the flare launcher, which had 24 flares. We usually use flares at night rather than white light, even though there are interesting stories uh, about using the white light. Here's four mini guns. That, that thing is an APU, auxiliary power unit. So we got power on board, we crank. And there's the NOS, the night observation um, scope. That door's wide open. These doors are taken off. Well, that door's taken off. So we're flying around with three doors off the uh, C-119. And then your flight deck's up here. Now on the Stinger, you had two more guns, one here, one there, the 20 millimeter cannons. You also had a big radar dome here and up in front. You can see them on the models, but you know they, they were so much more sophisticated than the shadows uh, were. The, we shadows were pretty basic. We got it, we got down there with enemy and shot it out with. 50, 50 uh, uh, caliber machine gun, 51 caliber machine guns firing at us and we're shooting right back at them. Um, we got hit, but we hit them. All yeah, right, next we slide. We were better shots. We were better shots, <laughs> plus <laughs> if it was nighttime, they couldn't see us. Their treasure was going behind us as we was going in. Most of the time. Now here's the K model, <laughs> the interior. There's the guns, the 20 millimeters. Uh, there's all kinds of things that they did on these uh, old C-119s to get them and make them into a uh, combat air, aircraft. Uh, air scoops and, uh, or smoke evacuation scoops. You know, the cordite builds up back there when you got those guns going, and it gets pretty smoky back there. Uh, all kinds of good things. Ron, what, what's a good thing that goes on back there? <laughs> you do a lot of dragging of ammo cans, don't you? We did. Yeah. Passive. Okay. A lot of yelling. Yeah. And of course, all the, all the crew members they're on they're on intercom. I mean, you know, the pilots up there, or the gunner, head gunner. He said, 
gunner pilot, you talk. Uh, pilot says, gunner, give me a, uh, a 20 uh, online. Plus Maybe. five radios. Yeah, plus listening to five radios. Person on the ground, uh, forward air controller in the air. Uh, of course, the, the co-pilots, uh, a lot of times I, I try to concentrate on the um, target and I told Copa, you got the radios. I'm, I'm going to talk to the gunners and ground commanders. Uh, you just got so much going on in your ear and your headset. Okay, next one. There's the four Gatling gun, mini guns, GE uh, models. Uh, there was another model used before. Here's the uh, ammo cans. I think they weighed 55 pounds a piece. And you get in in a circle and, and you're trying to pick up an ammo can and you're pulling a couple of G's, that gets pretty heavy to pick up that ammo can. A lot of gunners had back problems, okay? There were a lot, and like I told you before, gunners uh, had more spirit and enthusiasm uh, than any other crew, group of, of uh, crew members. And I had a gunner that... Uh, you guys were all volunteers, weren't you? <laughs> that that uh, uh, we, we carried uh, two M16s back there, and the gunners were in charge of those in case we <clears throat> went into a, a field or we needed them on the ground. Everybody carried a revolver. But uh, she, uh, uh, this gunner was so enthusiastic that he took one of those M16s and decided he was going to shoot two. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, the word got back to me and I said, Norm, we can't do that. You know, I'm the only one that shoots because if you shoot somebody, then I'm responsible for it. You shoot one of the good guys. So, anyhow, next one. <coughs> There is the NAS, the non-observation non scope. The navigator would stand right there in an open door. A lot of NAS navigators, bullets coming right through there. We never had one hit, thank goodness. Next one. Had a co-pilot hit though. Yeah, had a co-pilot, the bullet 51 caliber, came through the floor and nicked his leg and Lucky, lucky bit. there. We've had them bounce around in the cockpit, break windows, <coughs> shatter windows. Here's the flare launcher. That one's loaded and ready to go. Next. There's the white light, the white spotlight with the big magnet for anti-aircraft guns. <laughs> Okay, next. <laughs> That's uh, the, the uh, navigator station uh, on the C, uh, C-119K. That's your scope <laughs> there, I think, for the, um, for the FLIR, where they can make uh, <clears throat> hot spots, motors, trucks. Okay, next. Uh, don't forget elephants. <laughs> What's that? Don't the forget elephants. the elephants. Oh, the elephant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Water buffalo. Yeah. This is uh, the pilot's gun sight. It says so. Okay. Next. The pilot's on the left, aircraft commander. On the right is the co-pilot. You see that little handle on his um, uh, mm -hmm. con uh, control, a uh, uh, yoke? That's what he used to keep the altitude so he wouldn't affect the uh, bank that the pilot had in. 30 degrees left bank was the ideal um, bank. It's the airspeed. The Altitude and angle wasn't all correct. You didn't hit the target. Yeah. So it took three people to. With with the uh, co-pilot controlling altitude and the pilot controlling attitude, um, 
how coordinated were your terms? <laughs> very good. You'd you be good surprised. You like very, good. Uh, very good. And the and flight engineer maintained the airspeed. Yeah, the okay. flight engineer is right here, and you see his hand right there on the pilot's seat. And he's watching the instrument. The, the, uh, the co-pilot is looking out the right window, um, checking his right window for any aircraft uh, fire tracers, as well as working the radios along with the navigator back here. And, uh, but the flight engineer is watching the fuel flow, the oil pressure, you know, any, anything that goes wrong. Switching fuel tanks. The old motor will quit. You don't get that fuel tank uh, switch switched over. We had that a few times. I didn't know so. <coughs> so your flight engineer, and we were, I was lucky. I was the first lieutenant right out of pilot training. I hadn't flown these things except for uh, about six months, and, and then I was checked out as an aircraft commander. But the, um, that old flight engineer usually had a lot more time than I did. And he saved my, you know what? behind many times with those reciprocating engines and those props. <coughs> I remember the first time the red tracer were fi coming up there. Boy, I wanted to fly that jet. <laughs> he said, whoa, we got to put the prop levers up first before we have power. <laughs> okay, so that's the three that flew the airplane in the firing circle. That control that the co-pilot you mentioned, is that a trim or is that... That, 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 that is well on there. there. But what did it control? It's out the elevator. It did the control elevator. the elevator, but yeah. not, not the, the whole elevator or just the trim of the elevator? No, no it, just it's the, the whole elevator. The whole elevator. Yeah, it was your control so column right on the... Uh, that, that's so you didn't have to follow so the yoke column. You didn't have to follow the yoke column. Yeah, column. because oh, okay. the uh, pilot's over here going, doing. you know, trying to get his crosshairs right on the mm -hmm. target and... Uh, and if it's raining, uh, windy, bouncy, you name it, gets a little bit harder to get that crosshair on there. That's why I asked the coordination question, because if you had your crosshairs crossed, but you're not coordinated. You're not, not getting hit the target. targets. That's right. But back on that computer behind these, behind the pilots and stuff, back there with the table navigator, you could... Uh, put that thing down to, it had to be exactly superimposed if it was coming through the, the NAS, the computer, or if um, the FLIR on the stinger. But now if you were shooting manually, the computer's essentially off. <coughs> and the pilot can fire the guns whenever. And he says, give me a gun uh, to the gunners, pilot, uh, pilot the gun, give me two guns online, two mini guns. And uh, the gunner says, you've got number one and two ready to fire. So, yeah, they, you can fire if you're bouncing around, but you don't do it if you're shooting next to friendly troops, you know, on, on one side of the road and the enemy troops on the other side, uh, the book bullets can just wipe out. Sometimes you get a target that was just a suspected location of an enemy camp. Yeah. And you just waggle it the wings matter. and hit the rudders and <laughs> spray them like. <laughs> yeah, you'd spray a, a, a rubber plantation or a tea plantation <laughs> full of enemy hiding down there. You just load it with bullets. But we worked so close to friendlies one night, we heard the mic button, some noise on the mic button when they were transmitting, and the, one of the navigators asked what was that, and the guy on the ground came back, that's your bullets hitting. <laughs> okay, next one. There's the controls. That's on the G model. Uh, the two little white ones are prop levers. Then there's your throttles, pilot's probably throttles, and back. Well, I don't remember. Checks. 
I forgot what those switches were. K model? I think this might be the K model. It is, that's jets. Right there are your switches for your jets. Okay. You know? Jets up. And toggle, you toggle them. Right. And, and, and you could set it at, uh, you know, 50% jet. Uh, or all the way up to 100% jet. That is the K model. But there again, you see that handle yeah. that they have to, uh, the, the co pilot would use to maintain altitude. Were those trim wheels on either side that's the elevated yeah. trim? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those trim wheels. Now, his control overrode that, then, right? His control well, Where's that? that uh, oh, you've got the arrow. Good, that's what I need. Uh, now, see this little red button here? Yeah, full control of the elevator. Right here. Red button trigger there on the control. Trigger. Right there. Right there. No. Nope. You also have a trim right there on the wheel. That's a trigger. Right. So. That that uh, that's what was activated. And, and you uh, do that. Now. If you stepped up into the cockpit while they were firing, the the pilot's looking like this, and he's he's doing this number, and the and the co-pilot's over there running altitude like this. So that means that the pilot is going like this because he's not fighting the co-pilot altitude mm -hmm. nor is the co-pilot fighting uh wing right. yeah. yeah firing the firing yeah so Arch is set and i'm assuming you had elevator trim you left it alone you didn't touch it right because he's doing the finite with this right no, no. I think you could, it was he, he had a what. trim button there. He could trim that. You could still That's right. do that. Yeah. Because if you're in a if you're in that thirty degree bank for a while and it's trimmed mm -hmm. for level five, right. you're you're it's, <laughs> yeah. you're gonna get pretty strong. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aerobics, right? right. Plus the right rudder pedal, but anyway. Well the pilot ran the rudder pedal. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well you Yeah, because you could you could move your fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, by just kicking in some rudder and mm -hmm. moving over there. It'd be nice if there's yeah. never no wind, but <laughs> <laughs> so your your upwind turn and downwind turn were a little bit different. You had to compensate with rudder. Oh. The, the pilot, like he said, is sitting here. Here's his rudder pedals, and he's setting this is his seat. He's looking out that way toward Ed. When you guys got in the circle, what kind of speed were you at, roughly? 140 knots in the uh, indicator. Okay. And in a, in a uh, firing circle. And that would fluctuate. And again, that's where the flight engineer would monitor that airspeed. And the co pilot would say, FE, let's move the airspeed up. Uh, break right, like on the uh, stingers. Kick in the jets and get out of there. <coughs> So I, I gather then the frit, the jets were not throttleable in that they were either on or off. No, they they could toggle them, or you could up, toggle them down, or toggle yeah. down. Okay. You hold it up there, and it go 100 percent. Okay. There were gauges that he would monitor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Those yeah. jets. Right. Yes. Trust me. Yeah. Okay. Next. Lot of. That's the K model. That's a 20 millimeter. That shoots the big bullet. That's the gun sight. That's what it looked like in the daytime with this baby going off. And that's just a good picture of this stinger. Okay, next. That's the that's what it looks like on the outside, the stinger. The four many guns. Three twenty millimeter. Six six. Here's the radar now. Green gear door interior is not bad. <laughs> What was the caliber of the mini gun? 70, 7.62. Which is 30 calibers. They were basically 308s. 308. Oh, caliber. Okay. 7.62 by 51. Mm -hmm. No, I'm taking too much time. Supposedly they impacted like a 38 special at 12 feet. <laughs> Looking out the NOS door where that NOS night observation scope is. That's what it looked like on the stinger. Recep and then the jet. Next, there's the firing circle. So your pilot's always looking out the left side. Next, that's what it looks like at nighttime. 
This is a time-lapse <laughs> photo. And uh, these red bullets, those are tracers. And that's one tracer out of five bullets. So between one red tracer, there's four more bullets than a red tracer, four bullets. Uh, the tracer is a bullet. It's just red. Is the angle bank as steep as it suggests, as the picture suggests? I can hear that. Is the angle of bank the, as, as steep no. as the picture suggests? Uh, yes, it can be. Uh, now, this was taken in Fan Ring uh, by a gunner, a time-lapse photo, who was supposed to be on that mission, but he was uh, um, DNIF, he couldn't fly, so he went out and got his camera, and, and they were shooting at enemy <coughs> sites on that mountain. No, he died. But 30, when, when you're flying, okay, you're not going to keep 30 degrees bank all the time. You are going to cut a corner, mm -hmm. and you might shoot at 35, 40, 45. Yes. Now, when you go past 45 degrees, the co-pilot's <laughs> going to bring that baby back. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't know if you're just going to keep it going. He might have vertigo. Mm -hmm. Because that but, picture suggests you're past 45. Well, well, well you're on a pylon turn. You're not control. actually flying at that angle. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. Plus the weapons are... are they're uh, pointed down. They're pointed down. Beyond wing. Yeah. What are those silver things at the bottom of the picture? <clears throat> uh, that's... Uh, uh, those might be markers. Uh, no, that's those a lot of lights in the base. That's actually near base. Yeah, that's yeah. the edge of the base. Right? Hmm. Um, and don't ask me what the white part is up there either. I don't know. Heaven. <laughs> it's heaven. That's heaven. <laughs> okay, yeah. Now that, uh, I think that is 37 millimeter. That's an anti-aircraft gun that would shoot at stingers and sometimes shadow. But I think that is a 37 millimeter. Okay. Now that's what those babies would do. This is a stinger. Got hit in the nose. Go to the next, next one. There's one that got hit in the jet. We had a stinger that, oh, what was it, eight feet of the, uh, one of the wings was blown off. 14, 14 feet. 14 feet. And uh, they made it back, and, and they got the, uh, McKay Trophy for that year, uh, awarded to the most outstanding flight of the year. And, and a Stinger crew got that. Okay, next one. And there's one that did not have enough fuel to make it to the runway at Da Nang. And there happened to be a pond out there. <laughs> Nobody was hurt, or there was minor injuries yeah. but both engines on the left side failed on final approach yeah they bounced through a minefield uh -huh. uh, through the constantino wire and just as the cockpit started to roll under the, the one landing gear went into a foxhole and it pulled the airplane sideways and that's where it ended up you see where the co-pilot sits right there and he unstrapped and stepped out mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, there's the co-pilot mm -hmm. right here right there. <coughs> Other crews were not near that lucky. Now, go ahead. This is uh, this is uh, a shadow crash that killed all eight crew members. And Tommy Lubers. And Tom Lubers was the aircraft commander, lieutenant. Uh, Tom... Uh, was that 76 or 70? Yeah. Well, whenever you uh, look at their book, Tom's in here. He's a St. Louis boy, went to seminary, going to be a priest. This decided, well, I'm going to serve my country and became a pilot. Well, they lost an engine on takeoff there at Thompson Newton, in Saigon. And um, that's what you hear. 
The airplane wouldn't fly on one engine. It was too heavy. You establish a 200 rate of foot a minute descent until you got the gear up. And if on one engine, it could take up to a minute and a half to get the gear up. And then there was another shadow. This was Shadow 78, Tom Louvers. And we had a Shadow 77 crash and killed six out of eight at Tom Smith. So we had two shadow crashes and that we lost two airplanes. Um, in the G model. In the G model, shadows. Now in the K model, we lost four stingers. Um, go ahead and. Uh, Okay, that's your shadow. Let's see here. So four run. Um, we we lost uh, on, and, and on K and no, on on K. Uh, um, uh, we got a runaway prop out of the name. Yeah, they had to bail out over the South China Sea. Uh, there was one South Vietnamese that was killed. He got tangled up in the parachute when he was trying to rescue him. Yeah, he got caught in the, the boat. Color of the boat, rescue and, boat. In the rescue boat. Um, and there was a weather. One of them came back and he couldn't land, made several approaches. That was the very last one. That was in uh, their train at VNAF. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't land. But the one that claimed uh, American lives was uh, on K. It wasn't on K. <laughs> just ornery look. Well, it's the <laughs> some of these pictures in, in, in trying to make this slide presentation. They're out of proportion. It's like a 130 behind. That's right. It's another the 130 is behind it. Okay, next one. <clears throat> so we're brothers. We flew the old C-119 warplanes, <clears throat> underpowered. Overweight, right into the heart of enemy territory. We didn't go in North Vietnam. Stinger sure went close up there, right on the border with Laos. But uh, where we flew, the enemy owned the territory. If we went down, our pea shooters, which we carried, our 38 uh, caliber revolvers, I don't know why we carried them. I guess we'd shoot a monkey or something. <laughs> uh, like those M16s we carried for a while. Uh, loaded down with parachutes, uh, survival vests, mm -hmm. helmets. Uh, we were vicious looking guys. <laughs> <laughs> we were young, uh, brave, and indispensable. Or dispensable. <laughs> Expendable is what I was trying to think of. Because we were all young and uh, first lieutenants, captains, you know, the brass, they sat back and ordered party to go. But that's okay. We made it. That last one, I think that's it. End of show. I've talked enough. I hope I didn't talk too much. I hope I covered everything in here. The C-119s, um, before I forget it, um, even here in the United States, C-119s are gone. Last year, I went to Davis Monthly, uh, Monthly Air Force Base out in Albuquerque, I, because I flew two C-119Js to the Boneyard in 1973 when we disbanded our um, Air Defense Command unit, C-119s, and I was going to find my two old airplanes. I drove out in the desert. They'd all been cut up. They're gone. No more C-119s, even in states, unless they're at a museum or something. Um, there are some C-119s in gray ball, Wyoming, because when we were coming through uh, Wyoming, I saw three of them. 
but they had the jets on top. Okay. Water bombers. Yeah. Yeah. Water bombers. And and, uh, and then uh, Hagerstown, Pennsylvania, is probably the the, the place uh, that has more C-82, C-119 uh, airplanes. A big deal. One of the airplanes from Gray Bowl was flown from Gray Bowl, Wyoming, over to wherever they shot Flight of the Phoenix, if you saw the new addition to that one. 